Well, this morning, as I said, we're going to have something a little bit different. Ian and I are going to have a conversation. And uh, we wanted to take this moment just to look back on the year that's been. And it's been full of challenge. It's been some joy in it as well. And we wanted to just mark those uh, things that have happened and some of the challenges that we've faced, but also look ahead to what's to come and what we think God is leading us into and calling us into as a church. And so we wanted to invite you in on that conversation to, to listen in and be a part of that with us. And so Ian, I want to ask you first off a, a really simple question with a very long answer, I'm sure. How's the last year or 15 months been for you? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I think like you were saying, really, it's been a mixture of things, hasn't it? And I mm. think probably for all of us, um, it's a long period of time now, 15 months. Yeah. And I think you look back and you think um, there's some positives in it, I think. I think for many people, there's an opportunity to stop, certainly to stop the, the, the norm, because we've all had to do things differently. And in that, I think there's been an opportunity maybe for some people to reflect, maybe for some people to reevaluate: is this actually how I want to live my life or was the way that I was living it yeah. the way that I want to live it? Um, and uh, so I think there's been some positive stuff in it. Equally, I think there's been a huge amount of, of challenge. I was talking to someone this week and um, we were just talking about the fact that I think probably all of us in some way will probably emerge out of this period with some degree of PTSD. Mm. Um, and um, the psychiatrist I was talking to was saying that um, kind of the previous generation is like their, their whole generation was marked by their wartime experience. Mm. And he was saying that he's increasingly been thinking our generation um, are potentially going to be marked by the COVID experience. And when you start to um, see it like that, you think, actually, this is, this is probably a once in a lifetime, a once in a generation yeah. experience. The last uh, pandemic was the mm. Spanish flu, 1918, 1919. So it probably is you know, a, a once in a lifetime experience. Therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that the impact of it mm. probably will take quite a while, not just to be seen, because we're still yet to see some of the economic fallout, some yeah. of the psychological impact of it. Because um, even as we begin to get um, restrictions lifted, it's kind of I find myself you know, going to somebody's house and I think, oh, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> and then I have to climb over the fact and think, no, actually, it's OK to be here. Yeah. But I, I think just the impact of it is going to become clear over this mm. next period. So like you said, a long answer. Um, but I think it's been really mixed. There's some bits of it that I've really, I, I kind of thrive on a challenge. Yeah. And if you'd said two years ago, you're going to be sitting in the equivalent of a TV studio <laughs> with, with Richard and Robert counting down live <laughs> with all the cameras about to go. Um, I would have said that's one of the last things on earth that I would ever want to do. Yeah. And in many ways it was. Bizarrely, I've quite enjoyed the experience and, and the challenge of the new. So there is a real mixture between, between the two. And I think that's probably the story for all of us. Yeah, and I, I remember Dr. Henry Cloud right at the beginning brought out that teaching um, around crisis that we listened to and he spoke into. And I've gone back to a couple of times. And when you said PTSD, he said, actually, rather than it being post-traumatic stress, we're, we're living through present, present traumatic stress. And I yeah. think there's, there's nothing quite like it. And it seems in the last month, six weeks, I would say, people, as people are coming out of and as restrictions are lifting, it's like the adrenaline's worn off. Mm. And I certainly, I felt like kind of, we've been through a lot. And, and I know for you and for your family and for our church, it hasn't just been the pandemic. Um, so what would you say for you personally? Um, we'll come on to the church later, but for you personally, uh, what, what have been kind of the greatest challenges over this past year or so? So it's a good question. It's a big question. Um, because I think the reality is for all of us, we have the, we have the role that we're in. Mm -hmm and the challenge of walking through a pandemic with the role that we're in. And then we have the person who we are yeah. and um, the challenge to our personal life and to who we are. And I think um, it's gonna be an honesty moment, um, but um, I think for Chris and I, we've probably had the most challenging three years that we've ever had to live through. Mm -hmm. um, and by three years, you'll notice that predates yeah. the pandemic because um, we were already in a season of huge challenge before we ever hit the pandemic. And um, I have my family's permission to talk about this. I'm not going to say anything that um, we're not happy um, to talk publicly about. But um, about uh, three years ago, just over three years ago, Abby 
who's our youngest, who was uh, 14, 15 then, um, started to really, really struggle um, and uh, got diagnosed with, with really quite severe depression. Um, always enjoyed school, um, suddenly couldn't get to school, um, was overtaken by anxiety, couldn't sleep at night, um, couldn't function, um, found it difficult to get out of bed, get out of a room, um, let alone engage in everyday life. Um, as a part of the process of walking us through that, um, she got diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder, um, which, if anybody knows the background of that, is, is not only a uh, horrendous thing for a young person to have to face, but also a challenging thing for the family to have to face. So all of our plans, hopes, dreams, all of Abby's plans, hopes, dreams, suddenly end up um, kind of in pieces on the floor. Um, and she dropped out of school. Um, you try and save that and rescue it. I'm a great rescuer, <laughs> or trying to rescue, really good at, at creating a plan. Um, but we were faced with a situation that our good plans and our best intentions weren't able to solve. Um, and that was really, really challenging. Um, and I think, you know, we have the stress, both Chris and I work alongside one another in, in ministry, um, that we weren't able to, to manage all of that and provide what was needed to, um, to parent well yeah. in the season. I've always believed that um, in terms of ministry, ministry shouldn't compete with your family and your personal mm -hmm. life, actually. Your relationship with Jesus comes first. Yeah. Your personal um, uh, relationship with Jesus um, is, is the bedrock of everything. Yeah. And then your immediate relationships, you build on, on the back of that, uh, like another circle around it. And then your ministry is the next circle around that, and your church is the next circle around that. And so we felt we needed to, to retreat to cover the family. And a lot of people have noticed Chris hasn't been around so much the last um, couple of years. That's because we chose for Chris to take a step back, um, to be able to invest in, in Abby and keep things working well as a family. Um, I think for Chris, um, it pushed her to the edge of, of burnout um, through the process of trying to do that and balance everything else. I think for me, um, I've had some moments that I've thought, um, short of the grace of God, I don't know whether I'm going to get through this. Um, and then we got hit with the pandemic. Um, and uh, actually, Abby's done really well through the last 18 months, which is, which is incredible. And I, our girls, on one level, were at totally the worst um, point because um, one was about to do GCSEs, although Abby wasn't attending. So that was going to be a challenge anyway. Um, and Emma was doing A-levels and they all got cancelled. Um, but it meant that Abby um, wants to do music. She's very gifted musically. So um, her application to college was just based on an audition and she can smash an audition Fantastic. on video. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so she got into a music course and she's managed to complete the first year and, and do it actually really well. But we still had to build a whole programme and structure of life around that and manage that. So it kind of at a, just to give an example really, but at a, at a worst, one of the things that really calms Abby is to go for a drive. And she go for a drive, listen to her favourite music. And um, it gets her out the house and it provides um, a place of safety, security, place of relationship. And um, at various points, we were having to do three hour plus drives a day um, just to keep Abby going. Yeah. And uh, normally one of those would be at some point in the night. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes get up and speak twice on a Sunday morning at church and keep things going. So we were already um, facing personal challenges. And then we've had to walk through a pandemic on the back of that as well. So um, that's not been easy. No. <laughs> and then there's and been then, church. <laughs> yeah. And then there's been church. Yeah. And uh, we haven't had an easy year as Restore for, in lots of ways. There's been, um, we haven't just been dealing with leading people through a pandemic, which is hard enough, um, particularly when um, we ourselves were in real time going through a pandemic and it's tough isn't it in leadership you kind of have to have this hold this tension of, of being able to lead people through and um, and also working it out at the same time and I think you've already said but but for the grace of God really um, and it is it has to start with our personal time with Jesus and I think without that we're nothing and um, we've got nothing to give and I think that's been more true more than ever for, for us in leadership over this. I'm not, not just talking about Restore, but I think all, all church leaders. Yeah. Um, 
but do you want to speak into some of the, the challenges within, within church and what the, some of the toughest things have been over this past 15 months? Yeah, I, I, th- I think, like you say, Jody, the reality is I think anybody in leadership and leading an organisation through this last mm-hmm. period has probably been massively squeezed. I, I think about anyone in the health service yeah. um, and just what they've had to face and the stress and the pressure they've been under. Um, and I know we've got lots of people, lots of health professionals, which I celebrate as well. I think anybody in, in teaching yeah. um, or in schools, I, I, I am amazed that any head teachers are still going, yeah. given Incredible. just the changing in, in um, parameters, guidelines, and, and just the, the stress of, of trying to um, teach kids through that environment. And I think um, in church, there's been lots of challenges. You know, I look over the last year and I think, um, I think there's a, a couple of situations that have been the hardest to try and navigate through mm. um, in terms of navigate the church safely through. I, I think, like you said earlier, you know, this week's been the anniversary of the, of the murder of George Floyd. Mm. Um, and I know that we, I know that God's called us to be a church of the nations and for the nations. And um, the murder of George Floyd just ripped open um, a number of the nations within us as restore. Um, and I think what it showed, and something I would be reflective on, is that although we were a church of many nations, maybe we hadn't had some of the conversations. Mm-hmm that would have really helped us to cope with a release of pain and trauma in the way that we had. I'm thinking of, we obviously have um, a, um, a black community who um, it, it just ripped open the pain and the prejudice that so often they have felt. And it was like one more thing and one extreme thing, but it wasn't about one thing. It was about a whole history of stuff. And then we have a... a, a, a um, large number of South African folk who who I love dearly, many of whom were part of dismantling apartheid in South Africa and actually have stood for a rainbow nation and the creation of a rainbow nation. But just because they have a South African accent, it triggers people's perceptions of history and then people don't know exactly where they stand, what the history is in terms of race. And Heidi last week so articulately, but so shockingly, uh, it just detailed some of her experience as as someone who has Chinese heritage and yet was born and bred in the UK. And we had all of this live pain. And I think we were disconnected from one another physically, because normally what you would do is, is, you know, what a parent does, wraps their arms around the kid, cuddles them, um, and quite often just holds them while they cry and ministers love into that and we weren't able to reach out to one another and then people try and express support on social media and they use the wrong language or maybe don't quite get it right and then instead of pulling us together it's like um, it's like the tears get deeper and I'm Mm. so grateful for people like Paul and Rowena uh, Jennifer Isacor, um, Heidi was great speaking last week, people who stepped forward yeah. and said, actually, we know that as a church, we're called to stand as one. It might be really hard to do it at the moment, mm. but actually, we're going we're gonna to pull in close yeah. and we're going to stand for what we believe is that we will be a church that celebrates and gives place for every single nation. But to lead through that process, at one point, I, I thought this might just tear us all apart. And, and I thought we might say we're a church of the nations and, and, and I might be the only one left. Um, and yeah. Genuinely, yeah, genuinely, I because I all there. of your insecurities yeah. come up. And then you get the griefs. Uh, you know, I, I think whenever I think about that, I think of um, think about a loss of Frida. And um, somebody that is, is kind of like a pillar in church life. Um, and um, And then recognizing that the next time we all gather, um, Frida won't be there. Um, and that's hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure we've all got our own griefs yeah. and our own losses in, in different yeah. ways. That, that's one for me. Um, and then this last season, um, when I think about um, hardship, I, I, I think about we lost a team member in a way that we never expected to 
or weren't prepared for. Um, uh, suddenly it comes to light, sets off a process, which is the right thing to do because mm. we believe in accountability in church life, transparency in church life, authenticity in church life. But we never expected when the right process kicked into play, it would end up where it did. Mm. Um, and when things like that happen, it's a rip. It's a, it's a rip um, to us as a, as, a, as a staff team. It's yeah. a rip. Um, the reality is there's a gap where we didn't anticipate there being a gap. And so there's a stretch you have to make to cover that. And then there's all the personal relationships around that and everyone else that's ripped by it. The, the reality is, is um, in church, when, when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. You know, I stub my toe. <laughs> I scream. Yeah. Um, and when something like that happens, um, it rips us open. And again, it's hard to communicate well. It's hard to cover it well. It's hard to um, uh, weep with those who weep. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's been a challenge yeah. for us all. And we probably all will have been hit maybe by those things um you know maybe people watching it'll buy it be by other things but actually we stop and reflect mm. we probably feel quite battered and quite bruised yeah. by the last year and just trying to navigate through that as a church and lead shepherd through that mm. when you can't do all the things you historically would and you normally would um, is a challenge on top of which you never know what's going to happen next week <laughs> You know, you never know what restrictions are going to lift yeah. or when, and yeah. you're trying to plan, but you can't actually. You have to. You have to really, really plan in pencil. Yeah. Um, and and just when you think you're coming through it, there's a maybe another variant, and and it all changes again. Yeah. So there's the uncertainty of that. So, yeah, it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think uncertainty is the key, isn't it? That there's, it's really hard to be absolute in some of our decisions and planning. Um, because we just don't know what's around the corner. And again, some of the left field things have been some of the biggest challenges and the biggest hurts over the year. But, you know, you've spoken into um, the challenges at, at home, personal um, heartbreak, and then heartbreak and challenges and tough times leading church as well. And I have had, I'm not going to say a front row seat, I'm not in your home, <laughs> but a fairly close seat um, over this past year plus. And you're still standing. And I know it was close at times. Well, we're sitting today. <laughs> but I know there were moments where it was questionable. But you are still standing. And not only are you standing, but you're, you're still leading. And you're leading well. And I've been listening to a lot of Brene Brown again recently. And you know, she talks about brave leadership. And I think you are absolutely a brave leader and you, you lead courageously um, in the face of fear and in the face of challenge. And you lead with humanity. And I think hopefully this conversation, you lead with vulnerability as well. And I guess I wanna partly ask um, for my own growth and, and learning, but also, I think it's a really key question. How do you, as, as a leader, but as a Christian leader, as a church leader, how do you navigate and all of these challenges in the same 12, 15 months um, at a time like this? How, how have you been able to navigate that and still be standing? And I know a lot of people think you are, um, you know, unflappable maybe, or, you know, you're, you're tough and you're never going to fall. But I've seen the tears this year. And I've seen the pain this year and the grief this year. I've seen your heartbreak this year over some of those situations. And how have you managed just to carry on leading and, and do it so bravely? I think is probably my question. I hope there's a question in there. But I don't want to get too emotional. And I, you know, I, I just think as someone who's been able to witness up front and benefit from your, your leadership over this, well, over... The, the last 10 years, but particularly this last year. Um, what are some of the keys that help you lead well? Um, I, I don't know that I've always done well. Um, I think God's grace is amazing. Yeah. I often think about Paul when he writes about 
um, the grace of Jesus being sufficient for us. And he writes, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And I think sometimes when you are at the end of yourself or beyond the end of yourself, mm. um, I remind myself that God's grace is there. Yeah. And I think sometimes you end up standing because of God's grace and not because of anything else. I also think that when God calls you to something, he anoints you for it. Mm. And I think sometimes it's simply the grace of God and the anointing mm. that keeps us there. And so I'm not sure there is a, <laughs> here's Ian's wonderful, I, 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 I think. I perfect, but. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, he's not perfect. <laughs> Just ask Chris, I'm sure she'll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if you're on the live chat today, can you just mute Chris? <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Um, genuinely, genuinely, I think, I think God's grace. Mm. I, I think um, I've been in situations in the past and, and I, I genuinely, genuinely think um, when you've got nothing left, then you have to run to Jesus. Yeah. Um, and actually, in lots of ways, that's the best place to ever be. It's never a comfortable yeah. place. It's never the place I would choose to be. Yeah. But in lots of ways, it's some of the best ways. There's been some points this year I've thought, we can't get through this in our own strength. Yeah. The best Ian isn't big enough, isn't good enough, um, yeah. which is good because... Um, the best Ian is not meant to be good enough. Yeah. Um, the surrendered Ian is what's needed. Um, so I think that's one part of it. I, I, I think the other, the other part of it is, is I think um, good theology helps, by which I mean, um, I think if we're not careful, a lot of our theology is shaped by the culture around us mm. instead of actually what the Bible says and what Jesus says. And I think it's really easy to buy into the... If I follow Jesus, he will heal my heart, life will be happy, <laughs> and I will never be hit by anything difficult again. Um, and it's a lovely thought, yeah. um, but it resembles the American dream <laughs> more than it does what Jesus says. Because actually Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow me, mm. they need to be willing to take up their cross and die. Yeah. And I don't know of any significant Bible character that was really used by God, mm. that didn't go through yeah. a desert or wilderness experience where they were broken. Yeah. Um, and God uses that to strip away the stuff that needs to be stripped away. And one of the things I do in those difficult moments is I try and turn, it, turn my gaze to Jesus and say, Jesus, you can use this. Yeah. to do something good in me. And um, let me give an example. I try not to get too upset. Um, I think the NHS is wonderful. I think the way that people have managed the COVID situation is incredible. I think the NHS is, is criminally underfunded mm. and cannot possibly provide the support that we need. I think mental well-being is criminally underfunded. Um, I took Abby to A&E four times in her worst situations, four times in the middle of the night, because she said, Dad, get me some help. Mm. And four times I was turned away from A&E. And um, promised a phone call that I didn't always get. Um, and... In one of those occasions, um, as I got back in the car, I thought, I don't know that Abby's going to make it through these years. Um, and it was out of my control. Um, I can pray, I can fast, I can positively declare, I can prophesy, um, all of which I've done. Um, but I faced the moment that I couldn't control it. Yeah. Um, and that was a point of surrender was a massive point of vulnerability. Um, but as I sat in my car, I also thought, do you know, whatever happens to Abby doesn't need to define me because I'm making a choice that Jesus will define me. And, and it's amazing what comes to your mind in those mm -hmm. moments because in those moments I thought, God knows what it's like to lose a child. And if I lose a child, I can touch something of the heart of God that I would never 
otherwise be able to touch. Yeah. Um, and I think the reality is that's true. I know that's an yeah. extreme situation. Yeah. And praise God, we haven't been in that situation. But when you face moments like that, the reality is Jesus, you know, Romans 8 says all things work together for good for those who love God. That's not just wishful thinking, yeah. but it doesn't automatically happen either. All yeah. things work together for good for those people who, with the thing, take it to Jesus yeah. and say, no matter how painful this is, how traumatic this is, how difficult this is, Jesus, I'm going to give it to you, and I want you to bring something good out of it. And, and what I find happening is, is um, we die mm. to bits of ourselves. I've had to die to, I can't control the future of my child. I want to, but I can't. And so I have to trust Jesus. Mm. And sometimes I have to take my hands off and trust Jesus. Now, I, I probably <laughs> suffer from control. <laughs> probably any leader um, does. Um, but actually to have to yield and surrender that is a gain and it's a win um, and to be stripped away from the things that we so easily depend on although it's painful yeah. although it makes you raw is actually really good um, I'm struck Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 he um, details his suffering which is, is interesting a lot of us maybe would like to have the passion that Paul did <laughs> and plant the number of churches that Paul did yeah. and in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 he details what he goes through in the process of that and he talks about five times he faced 39 lashes three times he was beaten with rods once he was stoned three times he was shipwrecked yeah. he talks about being hungry about thirsty being naked he talks about being buffeted being bruised and then in the same list, he says, and the daily pressure of carrying the concern for the church. Mm. And I think um, part of leadership and leadership that cares and loves will get buffeted and bruised. But then Jesus got buffeted and bruised. Mm. And, and I mean, our last thing I alluded to earlier in terms of what impacted our team, I was struck that the week that that was playing out, was the lead up to Easter. Yeah. And I was reading, a number of us have been doing the, the Lectio 365 daily readings. Mm. But every day I was reading how Jesus was falsely accused, how Jesus was mocked, how um, he suffered all the way on the journey to the cross. And as things were playing out around me in different ways, I was feeling misunderstood, I was feeling judged, I was feeling like everybody hates me, I was feeling like all my friends <laughs> don't like me anymore. Um, not that I ever feel those things, obviously. Um, <laughs> but every step of the way, I was going, but Jesus has been there. Yeah. And actually through this, um, see, I don't, have a, I don't have a right to be understood. Yeah. I don't have a right to be right. I don't have a right to be agreed with. What I want to do is please Jesus. Mm. And in those moments, I could say, Jesus was quiet and he trusted God yeah. and he did what was pleasing to his father. And it really helped me to say, mm -hmm. take your eyes off what's happening around, put your eyes onto Jesus and say, in these moments, I can understand more of what Jesus went through and some more of me can be crucified. And I know that's not a popular, it's not a feel good Sunday. It's not the American dream, <laughs> is it? It's not, <laughs> it's not the American dream, but... Um, <laughs> Malcolm X said, I don't see a dream, I see a nightmare. Yeah. And if we don't face the reality, we set people up for failure. Yeah. You see, see, if we think Christianity is about, you know, I'm going to go on this fluffy cloud and, and look peaceful at all times. It's not like that. Yeah. You know, the early disciples, they laid down their life. They knew early missionaries, they used to pack their belongings in a coffin as they went on the mission field because they didn't have an expectation they would come back alive. It was a real, real laying down of a life. Yeah to see Jesus come. Maybe over the last 15 months, we've had to lay down bits of our life. It is possible to touch something fresh of the glory of Jesus out mm. of that and to come out the other side conformed more to the likeness of Jesus. And I think yeah. when you view hardship and suffering in that way, yeah. it becomes something that isn't pleasant, but it becomes something that God can make glorious. Absolutely. And that is worth going yeah. through. That's the gold, isn't it? And it, it makes us... You know, it, we 
often say we don't want to make things simple, but that is the simplicity of it. The simplicity of it, it's, it's about me coming to, to Jesus day in, dying to himself and coming to him day in, day out, because nothing else really matters. No. Because he's got the rest. And as long as my heart and you know, our hearts are right with him, hmm. then that's all we need to be concerned about, isn't it? That, that's, that's the gold. And I think I'm thankful this year that that is hopefully some of the stuff some of us have been learning along the way. Hmm. Um, and I know you've had extreme examples of that, but <clears throat> that is the gold of this year, that even in the roughness, there have been um, just moments of real revelation, I think. Um, we've learned the value of friendship and relationship yeah. because suddenly we were cut off from it. Yep. We've learned yeah. the power of a hug. Mm. Things that we took for granted yeah. that we would say in the grand scheme of life maybe weren't the things that we really valued. Yeah. Actually, they are the things that we really value. And, you know, Jesus talked about not seeking treasure on earth, seeking treasure in heaven. And at the end of the day, you know, I live... For the day that I meet Jesus face to face, not mask to mask, face to face, <laughs> and with an unveiled face, um, where it's got I can a new see now, in hasn't heaven. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. but, but when we meet Jesus face to face, and yeah. He says, "Well done, good and faithful servant," mm. I'm not. I'm not living for a big house. I'm not living for the, you know, all of the, yeah. the materialistic mm. dream. Yeah. I have to live for something beyond that, and that's worth laying my life down for. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to take a little bit of a, a turn now um, where we've had to dig deep into the pain to find um, the gold. What have been um, some of the more obvious joyful things over, or the, the good things that have come out of mm. this year, maybe with slightly less pain <laughs> and trauma? But there have I'll been try. some great moments as well. It hasn't all been, mm. you know, it hasn't all been traumatic. Mm. Um, no. There have been some real moments of joy and wow moments, um, personally and for mm. the church as well. So what would you say are some of those? I think um, the way that some people in church have stepped forward... Mm. has been incredible. And, you know, again, if you'd said two years ago um, we would be able to live stream yeah. at the standard we've been able to, um, I, I think we probably all would have laughed. And uh, normally um, what happens is, is the church kind of lags 50 years behind um, culture. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when it comes to tech. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so Where's the acetate? Yeah, we've got the OHP with the acetate, which I used to do in celebrations. Um, thankfully not anymore. No. But normally we are because, because we get comfortable with what we're doing yeah. and, and um, it stays the same. We stay rooted yeah. there. We've had to come into a, a, a modern age mm. and things like you mentioned the Henry Cloud stuff, that's all available on right now media and yeah. so the fact that, that actually we've discovered a tool that is a christian version of netflix that's yeah. on demand for discipleship and i know lots of our small groups are doing it i know lots of our small group leaders kind of um, they were leading their small groups to meet every couple of weeks so right through this period they've mm. been meeting every week and uh, making that happen you know we would have said you can't make a small group work on zoom we've made that yeah. work on zoom and had great fun um, we've been able to do interactive Sunday mornings, even though there's only a handful of people here, yeah. and sometimes not even that. Um, and, and they are great games, and actually stepping into a digital um, age is good. It, it's interesting when you track through church history, because significant moves of God have often been connected to significant breakthroughs in technology. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the, uh, the printing press... Yeah. Um, was a huge breakthrough for the gospel in terms of availability of the Bible and gospel literature and that kind of thing. I think the church stepping into the digital age actually is a huge opportunity to reach the younger generation to talk their language. You know, we're thinking about Pentecost last week and how um, when the Holy Spirit came, God changed the language. Mm. I, and I think that um, I think the Holy Spirit has given us the ability to speak a different language, which I think the future of the church will be reaching the next generation. Suddenly we're starting to engage in some of that and we mm. want to continue engaging into some of that. I think we've learned the importance of relationship. Um, what I've loved is the fact that, um, if I'm honest, quite a lot of us, our key church relationships was a cup of coffee at the end of a Sunday. Yeah. And when, when we've been robbed of that, the way people have turned up on different people's doorsteps, the thoughtfulness of some of the gifts, of the cards, of that sort of, the, the way that um, kind of relationship has ballooned outside of a Sunday, mm. I think is amazing. And please, 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 if you're watching, please, let's not lose that. Yeah. Let's continue with that because I think we've discovered something that goes deeper and further and, and is, is more authentic than the yeah. quick catch up on a cup of coffee at the end of, of, of 
of the meeting. I think the other thing is for many of us, we're more rooted and connected into our local community than ever before. You know, we, we teach, don't we? You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Love your neighbour as yourself, but we never ever see our neighbour because we're out commuting and, and uh, are busy doing other things. Over the last 15 months, some of us have discovered our neighbours in a whole new way. There's a massive opportunity for that. Please, 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 let's not go back to the busyness that yeah. means we dump all our neighbours. Yeah. Let's take the relationship outside of a Sunday and let's take the relationship in our local community and ask God to use that to bring change and transformation. Yeah, there's some... Uh, uh blog podcast this week, uh, Kerry Newhoff, and he had this guy, uh, Tony Morgan, on, and he just had some cracking quotes that speak into that. But one of them was, what we've learned during the pandemic is going to make the church healthier on the other side. Um, but this one, he said, disruption is an opportunity for the church to revisit the mission that God's called us to. And that, for, that feels so true for us that we've ha we had earlier on a bit more space and time maybe. I don't know when that was, but I feel like we had a moment where we still we got a bit more space and time, but I don't recall that now because I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> but that disruption's an opportunity for the church to revisit the mission that God's called us to. And we, we did have time to, to settle on that vision statement of, you know, we welcome everyone to walk with Jesus every day and to see restoration everywhere. And that, that, and that just captured something and that we're, we're sold on to now that this is what God's called us to. This is who we are. We, we've come to, to reconcile, to restore, to rebuild. We want to be people who celebrate and contribute and connect with one another. And so there's, there's lots that that disruption has been really helpful for us to distill. Who has God called us as restore to be? And so kind of as we look ahead and, you know, another thing Tony, this guy said, <laughs> bringing people back isn't a vision, moving people forward is. And I love that, that there's a lot of talk out out there in the world about going back to normal, I'm slightly subsiding now, but, but it's not about going back to normal. We want to move forward. We want to move forward with the vision of who God's called us to be as a church family. We've made it this far. We've made it through. We're still standing. We're still together. Um, there's a lot of us still around. So what are we moving into? We're, we're going to finish off in this kind of question, but what do you see as kind of the next uh, few steps for Restore? And what are you excited about in, in the next season? I think, there's, I think there's two things that I think are key for us going forward. Number one, I think we need to regroup. Mm. And 15 years without, 15 years? 15 months, <laughs> <laughs> even longer. Um, I knew my age. 15, 15 months without being able to be all together mm. is huge. And I think we need to regroup. One of the reasons that, that we're pushing so hard to save the date 17th and 18th of July, yeah. is there's an opportunity there to regroup. Yeah. And we've booked Davenant School. We've got the outdoor space. We've got the indoor space. We don't know what the regulations will be on face masks, on singing, all that sort of thing. What we do know is we will be able to all be together. Even if we have to go outside to sing or do everything outside, we will be able to all be together and sing. And I, I, I would encourage everyone, yeah. I'll talk to a camera, but <laughs> I would encourage everyone Get there if you possibly can. I know for some of us, we'll have to jump over hurdles to regather maybe in the numbers that we are, but get there if you can, because I think it's going to be key mm -hmm. to our healing and our moving forward. Um, I was, uh, somebody uh, suggested that I read Ezra mm -hmm. when um, the remnant of Israel returned when after Jerusalem had been destroyed, after mm -hmm. the temple had been destroyed, and a remnant regrouped, and uh, Ezra stood and he had rediscovered the law and he started to read it. And as he read it, there were those that wept mm. because where they were standing wasn't where they wanted to be standing. They thought about all the history. They thought about all the losses. There were some people there, they were celebrating because we're rediscovering the law and we're gonna rebuild. Yeah. Um, and there was a glorious mess really, <laughs> um, but it was a glorious mess into which Jesus stepped yeah. and a new chapter was reborn. And I think, I think it will be incredibly healing for us to be in the same physical space. Mm. And for me, the next few months are about regrouping the best that we're able to. Yeah. And I think, I think we'll do that just before the summer holidays, um, UK holidays probably for most of us. Um, I think over the summer, there'll be an opportunity just to be together and be used to being together. Uh, for me, I won't worry about anything else. Let's mm. just get together. Let's just be honest. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to be honest today 
is to say church is meant to work out of authenticity and honesty. And so let's not pretend, let's be honest. It's not been a great season. We all have, will have faced our challenges. Let's weep together where we need to weep together. Let's rejoice together where we need to rejoice together. But let's do it together yeah. because we are a community. God is at work and God can continue at work Amen. for us. And I think if we regroup over the summer, by the time we hit September, we will know what the next season will be and we'll be able to step back into our next stage or we'll be able to step into our next stage, our next season as a church. And we know that what God's called us to as restore is to bring healing and restoration. Mm. And as we find that healing and restoration as we regather, so I believe God will start to use us to bring healing and restoration yeah. into the different parts of our local community that we're connected with. We haven't got all the answers for how or when. You know, at the moment we're running a live stream. Some people aren't happy to gather yet. So we need to keep live streaming. There's people that are happy to gather. So we're providing gatherings that are uh, uh, available for, for people. And, and I know it feels funny not being able to sing and have a mask on, um, but for some people that's a lifeline because we can physically gather for other people it's like I'm not interested until um, you know I don't have to wear a face mask and it can really be face to face that's okay we've got to run the whole different things at the moment yeah. just to keep us journeying together and start to building together there will come a day when we can be all together again mm. and my vision is that we gather together to celebrate to be restored and to be healed but also so we can be sent into then being the hands and feet of Jesus and bring healing into our local um, contexts. Mm. And, and so our vision isn't going to change. Equally, I think we need to recognise we've been through something really traumatic yeah. and we need a bit of time to heal and come together as a body. And then as we do that, we'll be ready to step into the next season for mm. what God has for us. Sounds good to me. Well, I'm, I'm in. in. I'm excited by <laughs> I it. I think yeah. this isn't the way we would have chosen to do it. No. But... Um, often that's the way of the Bible and God brings something way better than we ever could have got to yeah. if we hadn't been interrupted in the way that we had yeah. and my prayer is that God will lead us into that yeah and it's absolutely better than the best Ian idea absolutely it's, it definitely much, feels much, like God's idea much much better so we're reassured by that <laughs> <laughs> as the as the band um, come up uh, and to lead us in our final uh, song of worship Ian would you pray for us any way you you feel led um but i just want to say well you're kind of preparing that like, thank you for your honesty um i know that comes at a cost and uh yeah we we love you we love chris we love emma we love abby and we're so grateful um to be family with you and and doing this strange strange journey together um and yeah let's uh yeah, I just want to invite everyone in and um, let's journey together into this next season. I think God's got great things for us. And I think there is, there is so much fruit to come from this tough season. Um, if, we would, if we only dig into Jesus and, and bring everything to him and put it at his feet and get our hearts right with him, like Ian was saying. So, yeah, let's, let's pray. Yeah. Um, when we were worshipping earlier, um, I felt a wonderful sense of peace. Mm. And we were singing about God being with us. And I know our last song is, is, is Another in the Fire, um, which is a song about the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when they were in a fiery furnace. Weren't sure they were going to come out the other side, but in the middle of the flames and the heat, there was another in the fire with them, which was Jesus. And... I don't know what the last 15 months have been like for you. What I do know is that Jesus is right alongside you and right with you. And just as he's walking me day by day through it, he's going to walk you day by day through it. And so, Lord, in these moments, Lord, Lord I just want to reach out and touch you again. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are in the middle of the fire with me. And thank you, that means that it's possible for me to come through this and come out the other side so that I'm not smelling of smoke, but I'm looking more like you. And Father, I pray for every one of us that has been squeezed, that has been pressurized, that has been broken, that has been taken to our limit and maybe over the edge. 
Thank you that you are able to rescue us. Thank you that you're able to restore us. Thank you that you're able to heal us. Thank you that you're able to bring something, something more of the beauty and the glory of Jesus out of that. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, I pray for everyone who's watching right now. Thank you that you're a friend that sticks closer than the closest brother. And I pray for such a sense of you being alongside, for such a sense of you being in, for such a sense of not being on our own. But I pray that you'll break the power of isolation. I pray that you'll break the lies of the enemy. And we put ourselves into you and we celebrate your presence and we celebrate the God who is gonna bring us through this and out the other side. And it, and who is working to glorify his name and bring his kingdom in.